Hello everybody and welcome. Welcome to Salem Plus. I'm very sorry I couldn't get to church yesterday uh, because I was contacted by Track and Trace so I need to wait until my PCR test gets back. I'm very uh, grateful to Paula for reading my sermon for me and she suggested I might like to record it myself so that's what I'm going to do. So let's pray before we begin. Father God, thank you for your love for us, your love which surrounds us from cradle to grave, your love which holds us, your love which doesn't leave us without guidance but speaks to us through your word and through your spirit. And so, Father God, we pray that as we consider this difficult passage today, your spirit will indeed speak to us. Amen. So we've been working through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount as part of our emphasis on discipleship in 2021. And today we're going to kind of just press the pause button. We're going to stay in the Sermon on the Mount, but we're going to look in a bit more detail at a phrase which came up in our reading last week, but which I didn't have time last week to give much attention to. And it's the phrase, the evil one. So Let's hear the reading again. It's a, a very, very short one. It's Matthew 5, 33 to 37. And it goes like this. Again, this is Jesus speaking now. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, don't swear an oath at all either by heaven, for it's God's throne, or by the earth, for it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And don't swear by your head, for you can't make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So what's all that about? Well, the dictionary tells us that this last phrase, the evil one or evil, comes from a Greek word which means bad or evil, as you would expect. But it also means the negative moral quality of a person opposed to God and his goodness. And it's a title of Satan. It occurs in the Bible about 76 times. Some Bible versions translate it as the general word evil, but some give it a more personal quality, the evil one, or Satan. What are we to make of this today in 21st century Wales? C.S. Lewis very famously said, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe but to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. Now, I don't tend to speak about the devil a lot in my sermons because I worry that too many people in our churches fall into the second category, that is, they feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in demons. But neither must we make the mistake of falling into the first category of disbelieving in their existence altogether. And I think I would be neglecting my teaching responsibility if I ignored this topic completely. So today I'd like us to consider this question. Who or what is the evil one? In Jesus' time, most people seem to have believed in evil spirits, and these evil spirits had a strong influence over people's daily lives. Many of the things which people used to attribute to evil spirits, such as epilepsy, we now understand to have physical causes. We also, nowadays, in this country at least, tend to use the language of mental health to describe many things which used to be described by the language of spirits. But listen to someone suffering from severe depression or drug addiction, for instance, and they may well talk about being bound or trapped, which echoes biblical language about being under the influence of bad spirits. Psychologists talk about the inner voice many of us tends to hear, which says to us things like, you're no good, you messed that one up, didn't you? Nobody loves you, and so on. These negative feelings and emotions convince us that there is no hope, that we are trapped 
and that we are unloved. These feelings and emotions stand in direct contrast to the vision of faith, hope and love set out so clearly in the Bible. They are untruths which oppose the goodness and healing purpose of God. In the words of the dictionary definition of the Greek word for evil, they oppose God and his goodness. So whether you call them bad spirits, or whether you use a technical term for psychology to describe what's going on here, whether you believe that they come from outside us, or from within us, or from both, most people would agree that there is some sort of reality here which we are struggling to describe. It's a reality which is the enemy of hope and goodness, the enemy of human flourishing. It's the enemy of everything that God wants for all his children. So I'm not going to bother about whether I call it a devil or a demon or, or whatever. I'm just going to call it the enemy. <laughs> so what do we know about the enemy? Well, I would suggest two major principles to bear in mind. The first is that contrary to what some people would have you believe, the enemy is not in competition with God. Sometimes people depict God and the enemy being in battle. Well, this is nonsense because it implies that the enemy is somehow a match for God. Nothing can compete with God. God is so big, so strong and so mighty. God's love fills the universe and God is constantly bringing about his purpose of healing, shalom and salvation. The enemy can only gain a foothold if God permits it. And why God might permit it is a subject for a whole other sermon. You and I have nothing to fear if we choose to remain without, within God's love and protection. Now don't get me wrong, this doesn't mean that the enemy isn't dangerous. He is. But the danger only comes when you and I say that we don't need God, when you and I stop abiding in him because God respects our decision. And it's in that space where we reject God that the enemy can flourish. I'll say a bit more about this in a minute. And the second thing I want to say that's really, really important, really important is that the enemy is a liar. This is the enemy's fundamental mode of operation, lies and deceit. It's completely opposite to God's way of operation, which is truth. 1 John 1 5. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. John 8 44. Jesus describing the enemy. There is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. Truth is the language of God, lies are the language of the enemy. That's one very good reason why you and I should choose the language of truth and avoid lies at all costs. What sorts of lies does the enemy tell? The lies the enemy tells a person depends on whether that person is traveling towards or away from Christ. To the person who's not a Christian, the person who has rejected Christ, the person whose lifestyle and decisions are taking her further away from God, to that sort of person, the enemy tells lies which comfort. They might be something like this. You've got the right to make your own decisions about what's right and wrong and how to live your life. So well done for being independent. That's a very old lie, that one. <laughs> we see it in Genesis 3. Or, ah, you're too intelligent to believe all that nonsense about God. Or, why don't you go out with your friends and get drunk tonight? At least that will take away the pain of living and make you feel better. Or, a half-truth, and the enemy specialises in half-truths. If you go to church, you'll just feel worse about yourself. This is because the enemy is trying at all costs to stop such a person from making changes in their life. Changes which will bring them into a knowledge of God's forgiveness, love and care. The enemy 
wants that person to be destroyed. But God wants to save that person. And it's interesting that to such a person, the Spirit of God, which is the very opposite of the enemy, often tells truths which disturb. They might be something like this. You're not really happy. You're just kidding yourself. Do you really want to spend the rest of your life like this? You're just putting off going to church because you don't want to face the truth about yourself. So to a person who's traveling away from Christ, the enemy tells lies that comfort. And God's spirit of truth tells truths that disturb. What about the person like most people in church, the person who's a Christian, the one who's traveling towards Christ, the good person who wants to be better? Well, to such a person, the opposite happens. The enemy tells lies that disturb such a person. The enemy knows that the person who's entrusted their life to Christ is safe and nobody can snatch them out of the Father's care. Jesus says in John chapter 10, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. But what the enemy can do is take away that person's peace and joy if we let him do that. And so to such a person, to the person held safe in the Father's care, the enemy tells lies which disturb. Lies like this. God saw what you did yesterday. How can you call yourself a Christian? Do you really believe that you're God's beloved child? Where's the evidence for that? You are just imagining that feeling of peace you had last week. It's gone now, hasn't it? If people in church knew what you were really like, they wouldn't let you do the things you do in church. They wouldn't even let you be a member. These are lies which disturb us and snatch away our peace. But to such a person, the Spirit of God tells truths which comfort, such as, You are God's beloved child. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I have come that you may have life, and life to the full. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not die, but have eternal life. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my strength come from? My strength comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And so it's very important for you and me to know the enemy's tactics and to recognise them. Because the enemy is opposed to the love and peace of God. However, we must not fear the enemy. John, in 1 John chapter 4, tells us that God, he who is in us, is greater than the enemy, the one who is in the world. And James, in James 4 chapter 7, tells us, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The enemy flourishes where we grant him room, where we allow his lies of despair to stifle the vision of faith, hope and love which the Bible promises. But the enemy is no match whatsoever for the Spirit of God within us. When you and I, through the power of the Spirit, resist the enemy, he flees from us. Let us then ask God for wisdom to discern the lies of the enemy and power to resist them by holding on to the truths of the Bible. Amen. And now may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown us.
May he bring you home rejoicing once again to our doors. Amen.